Hi, everyone. My name is Regina McClinton, and I am the Chief Officer for Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion. And it is my pleasure to welcome you to our April session of Race in Healthcare. And I am thrilled to be joined by my colleague, Dr. Jasmine Luzum of the College of Pharmacy, who has been doing some outstanding work in um, cardiac uh, pharmacology, if you will, and in particular around beta blockers and uh, the use of race in that. So we're gonna be discussing her research, but before we do that, I want us to talk a bit about um, how healthcare identifies a patient's race or ethnicity. So of course, we've all been to a doctor's office and been given a form to fill out and asked to identify ourselves. But other than that sort of self-identification, what are the other ways that a patient's race is commonly determined in healthcare? Um, so it, it depends on a few things. Um, one, like you said, is how you're presenting to the healthcare system. So if you're presenting to like an outpatient clinic, like you mentioned, and you know, you fill out your intake form, then you can self-identify that way. Um, another way is, you know, if you have an emergency and say you've never been to this healthcare system before, Usually when you have an emergency, the ambulance takes you to the nearest healthcare system. Um, and so if you're presenting to the ER, um, you know, somebody else is usually doing your intake. So like a medical assistant might be doing your interview. And so they could ask you that way. Um, and so somebody else is kind of assigning your raise for you if, if you don't answer in that case. Um, an important point to make is that every healthcare system, their EHR is different. Mm -hmm. There's no standard EHR at any health system. And so the categories, the, the race categories that could be selected differ by healthcare system too. Mm -hmm. And I think there's major, major limitations in these categories. Um, you know, the human race is, is a spectrum, you know, right. We, most of us don't cleanly fall into, you know, one of five categories, even though that's that's how the U.S. Census, um, the government does it too. Right, right. Um, so for example, you know, I have an adjunct position at Henry Ford Health System in Detroit. And, you know, the way the demographic data is categorized in the patients there is like the categories are um, white or African American, and in you know, other categories too. Our, our research is mostly in comparing um, self-identified white and, and black patients, mm -hmm. and I, I really disagree. And so, in our papers that we publish, you know, we want to be with consistent with how the health system right. you know, records the patient's race. But I really disagree with that terminology mm -hmm. by having the two different categories as white and African American. I feel like that implies that white is the default American. Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. why, why do we have to specify in somebody with African ancestry that, that they have the hyphen that says they're American? So I think there's major limitations in you know, how race is captured in our healthcare system. Like I, I'm an example of that too. I've never known which category I fall into. Like I, I, I made my own category. I consider, I don't consider myself black or white. I consider myself beige. And like, <laughs> beige is never an option um, in one right. of those categories. So, um, so yeah, that, that's how, you know, my interpretation is of how race is captured in, in our healthcare systems. Um, you know, there's usually like an other category. If you don't cleanly follow into one of these five major categories, uh, there's usually like an other or a more than one race um, category, um, which, you know, uh, someone who's of mixed race, that could be, you know, thousands of different like, right. potential combinations. So categorizing all those very diverse individuals as just more than one race category is not, is not good. Um, and then, so you have like the race category and then you also have your ethnicity which mm -hmm. is usually binary of Hispanic or non-Hispanic. Right. 
And that is also really problematic because, you know, what if one out of my four grandparents is Hispanic? Right. Like, does that make me Hispanic enough to right. say yes? Or am I not Hispanic enough to, to say yes to that question? So I think, you know, we there's a, a lot that we need to do going forward and how to adequately capture um, this one variable among a multitude of variables that describes our patients. Right, right. And that confusion really is reflective of what race is, right? Being a social construct, just like if you think about gender and how we think about women, how that has changed over, right? You think about, I think about the definition from my grandmother who was born in 1902, right? She never really worked. Um, and then I think about my mom who had a career before she met my dad and they agreed that she would be a stay-at-home mom. And then I think about myself, or I'll go with my sister because she's the one who's married and has a kid. And, you know, she still works and society accepts that, right? And so what it means to be a woman in society has changed over the years. And so in the same way, what race is and race is not has also changed over the years. And we've tried to go, as you were pointing out wonderfully, with the sort of you're either this or that perspective. And, and I don't know that America ever really fell into that kind of a, a binary perspective, but certainly not now. You know, you think about the other category, almost anyone who's been, who is of African descent, who has been in this country for several generations could easily click other, right? Yeah. Um, but I couldn't even tell you what my other was, right? right? So it's like, well, I know we're Black people and we're proud to be Black people. So we're going with the Black category. Right, yeah. And so it's more of a social identity than anything around my biology. Yeah. So it's interesting. And I appreciate your study. We're going to dive into it in just a moment. But thinking about, do we need to use race? as an identifier. And I feel like that would just be such a shakeup to the medical field if we did that. Yeah, um, on one hand, by us continuing to use race as a variable in biomedical research, mm -hmm. we're sort of reifying the misconception that race is a scientific construct mm -hmm. when it's really not. It's, a, wow. it's mostly a social construct there's some correlation with genetics, but it's not um, not perfect. And our, our research, I can show you that later. Yeah. Um, so that's one reason to not not use it in our research. One one way it can be used, you know, using it as a variable, it encompasses multiple other variables. So it's kind of a simple way of kind of capturing a bunch of other things. So, right. you know, socioeconomic right. status, education right. level, some correlation with genetics, um, you know, healthcare access, healthcare quality, like all right. of these things are tied into somebody's race. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's fine if you use race in research, as long as the goal is to try to understand, well, which of the underlying factors That's is great. causing this racial disparity. Right. So our research, you know, there's tons of things that correlate with somebody's race. And um, we've actually I actually think genetics is pretty simple compared to race. So we actually, you know, we analyze our data both by how patients identify as their race, but then we also have whole genome data. Mm -hmm. too, so we use their genetics, too. So the advantage of using genetics, you know, that that is a scientific Right. That is scientific data. You know, that right. your genetics are the product of thousands of years of evolution. Yes. Um, and so, you know, we're looking at differences in drug benefit. And if we see differences in drug benefit by someone's genetics, but not their culturally identified race, then that will signify, you know, there really is a pharmacologic yes. mechanism underlying this racial disparity. Mm -hmm, if, mm -hmm. if we don't, if genetics doesn't explain that, then that is pointing to, well, it's probably these social factors right. contributing to differences in drug outcomes. Like, 
you know, maybe, yeah, these patients are all prescribed beta blockers, but maybe this, this group of patients on average, like they don't have a pharmacy in their neighborhood or they can't get to their pharmacy. Like they don't right. have transportation to get to their pharmacy. Their pharmacy doesn't deliver. They can't, they have a, a worse health insurance plan, so they can't right. get the copay. So that's why we try to separate out the genetics, which would mm. point to real pharmacological differences from, you know, these potential social factors. And I think, so that's one way I think it's okay to use mm-hmm. race in, in research, as long as you're trying to figure out like, what are the real reasons underlying this, this race difference? Because and I think that's important because that's going to show, that's going to guide like what interventions are necessary. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, if we, if we find a difference in genetics, well, then maybe we need to genotype patients right. and use different g- drugs, depending on what the patient's genotype is. Right. But if it's access to a pharmacy is the problem, then that's a totally different, you know, problem to solve with a totally different intervention. So, right. Right. Yeah. Awesome. So when we talk about genetic interest in when we talk about genetic ancestry, uh, and it was one of the things that I thought was so striking in your paper, um, you know, for African American, usually we talk about what country are you from, and you know, we see the ancestry.com and 23andMe, and like we thought we were German, turns out we're Italian, right? And that's a country. They're probably locating a person to like a clan within that country, a region, but that gets you a country. But for African Americans, Right, because we are the descendants of those who were stolen and that ancestral knowledge was was taken away from us. Um, We don't have that kind of information. So would you talk a bit about how you address genetic ancestry for those who have African descent and uh, in particular with your study? Because I thought that was very striking. Yeah, I mean, you make a good point. Like our, our research on genomics in European ancestry is way, way, way far ahead of other ancestries. Probably Asia is next and Africa mm-hmm. after that. Um, so yeah, for if you have European ancestry, you can pinpoint a country. If, if it's African, you can probably pinpoint a continent. And right. <laughs> Africa is, is huge. Um, there, is, there is some ways to try to, um, you know, pinpoint what region in Africa um, it comes from. But um, so we, what we do is not that different than these ancestry direct to consumer genetic tests. Okay. Uh, We use a slightly different algorithm um, because um, that's supposed to be better in in African-Americans because that group as a whole underwent recent um, population, like a historical event within the past 200 years. Um, So we, and also because genomic research is so far advanced in European ancestry, a lot of the genotyping methods that we use don't capture all of the genetic diversity as well in African ancestry as European ancestry. Right. So in, in order to overcome that limitation, we had a, a special customized genotyping chip okay. to help improve African ancestry. So we use this Axiom Affymetrics Biobank bio array, um, but um, it includes, so in total, it includes about 600 genetic variants that are um, selected to optimize imputation you know, cause there's probably like a million independent genetic variants uh, okay. within our genome. Um, but this chip was special customized in an extra 50,000 genetic markers that we know are specific for Yoruba ancestry mm-hmm. um, were on that chip. So that improved the coverage of West African ancestry on the chip that we use um, because of, you know, for, because of the slave trade, um, African-American ancestry, a lot of it comes from West Africa. Okay. So that's why Yoruba markers in particular were, were added to this chip. Um, so we can use an algorithm that can um, quantify what proportion of their ancestry is Yoruban. Okay. And so that's how we um, analyze ancestry in our data. Um, so yeah, but that, you know, Africa is a, a really large continent. Um, So that's, you know, it still doesn't cover everything, but it's better than than most um, methods that we have. 
So in one way, then doing that gives you kind of a specific population. So in other words, if you're going to study Japanese Americans, Japan is a very specific place, right? And so you can get, (laughs) right, right? And so (laughs) you can get um, this genetic idea of Japanese ancestry. And so this allows you to assess essentially West African and more specifically Yoruban ancestry, which can then obviously give uh, potential um, information about Africa on a larger scale um, and using other markers uh, could be very useful, but certainly this gets you into a very large contingent of the African-American population in this country. Yeah, exactly. And, you know, one advantage of this is it's, we now have a a continuous variable. It's Mm -hmm. not categorical. Like, are you black or white? We can quantify, and it's like, you know, in our data, it's a really broad range of how much Yoruba ancestry is in our patients. And it, it was really interesting. There's, you know, several patients who self-identified as black and they had 0% Yoruban ancestry. Right. And there were several patients who self-identified as white and they had 100% Yoruban ancestry. And it, it happened so many times, like at least in 100 patients, that it's yes. not, there wasn't a data entry error. It's, right. It's just the way our, our country is. Um, yes, yes. So. Um, on a side note, I have found it entertaining uh, people who identify as white supremacists who take these DNA tests and find out they have African ancestry and then try to come up with some incredibly ridiculous explanation as to why. Yeah. But I digress. Yeah. Well, right. I mean, we all we all came from Africa. So <laughs> right. <laughs> So I want to get into uh, the work that you've been doing, and in particular, your research paper that we shared with everyone. And your research question is asking, are beta blockers similarly effective in Black patients as they are in white patients? And so let's go ahead and start with sort of the basics. And would you briefly share what beta a beta blocker is, why they are used, and as you get ready to do that, because I know you've got some slides to share with us as well, I just want to ask Mrs. Archer if she would give uh, you control to share your screen uh, as you like. Um, so yeah, I mean, beta blockers, you know, really commonly used drug, definitely in the top two hundred prescribed drugs. They protect the heart. They have multiple mechanisms to protect the heart. So they're used in multiple different indications and in cardiovascular disease. So like ap- after somebody's had a heart attack, um, it's a foundation, essential therapy in anybody who has heart failure. Um, and it's kind of like a third, fourth, fifth line agent to treat high blood pressure. Uh, okay. Too. So they're, they're used, they're used to if somebody has an arrhythmia, there, there's lots of reasons we use them for different cardiovascular indications. You've probably heard of beta blockers, like pretty much any drug that ends with olol, like metoprolol, bisoprolol, carvedilol, um, those are all beta blockers. And um, we have done similar research um, with angiotensin inhibitors too. So I, this, the angiotensin inhibitor data hasn't been published yet. So mm-hmm. I shared our published beta blocker paper. Um, so I just submitted the paper for angiotensin inhibitors. And so that includes ACE inhibitors okay. um, in angiotensin receptor blockers. And we found similar results as, as the beta blocker uh, results. So that was kind of interesting, but um, so yeah, that's what beta blockers are for. Awesome. And what was the common thinking or has been the common thinking about beta blockers and race prior to your paper? Yeah. So um more for the angiotensin inhibitors, there's a really well-established and ingrained in all healthcare providers that there's a racial disparity in benefit from angiotensin inhibitors like ACE inhibitors and ARBs. This is in the guidelines. So the American Heart Association, American College of Cardiology, they published guidelines, which you know that's what most healthcare providers follow when treating patients with cardiovascular disease. 
Um, so the, the guidelines for how we treat high blood pressure, there's a specific branching, like in the, in the flow chart. It's like, if you're black, you treat the patient this way. If the patient is not black, you treat the patient this way, the other way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So if you're black, ACE inhibitors and ARBs are not a first line therapy. Okay. Um, because some of the data had shown that they don't work, work as well um, in patients who self-identify as um, black. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, for beta blockers, you know, we there's some suspicion of the same thing, but it was the data wasn't strong enough to make it into the guidelines as a race-based recommendation. So that's oh. that's for the treatment of high blood pressure. Like those same drugs are used to treat heart failure as well. So heart failure is a is a syndrome where you know one out of five patients will die within one year, and so it's it's really important that we find effective drugs to help mm -hmm. to help heart failure patients um, live longer. Um, and so our main research question was, you know, if if angiotensin inhibitors are less effective in black patients with for the treatment of high blood pressure, you know, are they less effective for the treatment of heart failure as well? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And there, there had been some really concerning papers published in New, in New England Journal, um, sort of suggesting that angiotensin inhibitors are, are also not effective in black patients with heart failure. Okay. And some editorials came out after that paper saying, you know, so, so physicians may think, you know, I shouldn't use an angiotensin inhibitor in a patient with heart failure. And that's just a really scary thing that we could be potentially withholding a life-saving drug right. from a patient solely based on their race. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, in order to answer that research question, you know, are these drugs as effective in black patients with heart failure? You know, the, the best way to do that is to, well, look at the, the placebo controlled trials like specifically do a subgroup analysis of the black patients versus the white patients in those mm -hmm. trials. The problem is those big trials that establish the efficacy of these drugs, you know, the first one, there was zero black patients and right. it was done in Scandinavia. So there isn't even Asian or any other right. <laughs> uh, race or ethnicity in that trial. That was consensus. And then since then, you know, some of the enrollment, the diversity of these trials got a little better in the 90s, mm -hmm. but then back at, and then again in the 2000s, you know, there, the enrollment of Black patients in those trials is between like zero to five percent. Okay. So we don't really have enough data right. to know, like, are these drugs working as well in Black patients with heart failure? Um, and so somebody tried a meta-analysis of those, you know, those few black patients in those trials, and, and they found that it didn't look like they were. Okay. Um, but since it was such a small sample, we're, we're still not sure. Uh, but the heart failure guidelines, you know, still say treat everybody with an angiotensin inhibitor, regardless mm -hmm. of their race. Um, so my mentor, David Lamphere, he's a, a heart failure specialty cardiologist at Henry Ford. You know, since there's not enough data in black patients right. uh, and being uh, located in Detroit is right. advantageous for the recruitment of black patients and in, into studies. Um, so he started his own um, data set back in 2007. Okay. He enrolled, since then, it's enrolled a thousand heart failure patients, um, half self identify as black and half, half self identify as white. Um, so we. <laughs> We, we tested this uh, question and the, the good news is we found equal benefit in black okay. and white patients with heart failure. So that's, it's good and it supports the guideline recommendation, those mm -hmm. drugs be treated in, in all patients regardless of their race. But I wonder, um, and we looked at it by ancestry too. Mm -hmm. So, and we didn't find any differences by their ancestry. What's, what's unique about Henry Ford the health system and, and the data that we use. And I think it's playing a larger role than what we initially um, suspected is um, all of the patients in our study are all have the same health insurance plan. Ah. So Henry Ford health system has this is unique compared to the rest of our country. And that, you know, a large 
proportion of their patients have this health alliance plan. So the health alliance plan um, sort of evolved several decades ago um, because Detroit is the center of the automotive industry and uh, the automotive companies wanted healthcare for their employees because they knew while well, they, they couldn't work if they <laughs> weren't in good health. So in order to provide good healthcare for the employees, this health alliance plan was started. Um, and so all the patients in our study have the same health insurance plan. So I think unlike the rest of our country, we sort of uh, are eliminated some disparities that exist in most other places in our country in that um, the disparities we know that exist in access to healthcare and quality of healthcare because you know, we eliminated the access to healthcare barrier because all the patients had health insurance and we somewhat eliminated the quality of healthcare disparity because they all had the same health insurance. Um, so I, you know, I, I wonder how much of a role, and I, so I wonder if um, you know, those really old studies that found racial disparities, if they had investigated, you know, what, what kind of health insurance coverage did these patients have? Could that be contributing to why we're not seeing as much you know, outcome benefit for one, one drug? And, um, and they also didn't have ancestry data either. Right, right. So th that kind of brings me back to the point where I was like, we need to understand why there's racial disparities. Cause yes. what, what if, if everybody had the same health insurance plan, maybe we wouldn't have seen these, these racial disparities in, in, in drug outcomes. So, um, so does that answer your question? It was really it long. Does. No, yes, no, it's an excellent, excellent answer. And it kind of brings up this point. I would assume that until recently for the majority of medical students and pharmacy students and even nursing students asking the question of what, else is happening here, being taught to consider race, um, health disparities has not been occurring. Yeah. And so what would you want people in healthcare providers to, to understand or think about when thinking about health disparities and treating a patient, considering things about a patient? I think that's beyond my skill level, but <laughs> I, I totally agree with you. Like, you know, I was trained that way, you know, when you're presenting a patient case in the first line of your presentation, is that this is an African-American male, age 42, you know, like mm -hmm. their race, is like the first de defining factor you say about the patient. Um, right. And so, yeah, I would say as, as far as, um, you know, training the next generation, I think we need to be, teach them to be more cognizant of like what, you know, why why are we considering this patient's race? Like what are, cause obviously like the color of their skin is not gonna like determine whether or not this drug works in them. Like there's right. gotta be something. So what are these other variables that correlate with race that, that we need to um, be aware of? Yeah, yeah. I forgot to mention, so there's, you know, in cardiology, these race-based drug recommendations, I mean, they really bother me. <laughs> Um, so I talked about the one in hypertension yes. where we don't use ACE inhibitors, ARBs in patients who self-identify as black as, as a first line therapy. They could be added later on, but um, they're not recommended first line. Um, in heart failure, we, we have an opposite one where there's a, a drug that's effective in black patients, but not okay. in um, patients who are, who are not black. And so it's a, a combination drug, hydralazine, isosorbide. Um, so yeah, so in, in the hypertension guideline, you know, they give, they give providers these flow charts, like this is how you treat the patient. So in hypertension, right. you know, there's a race branching that says don't treat black patients with, um, ACE inhibitors, ARVs, but in heart failure, there's another branching where it says if the patient is black, mm -hmm. you know, make sure you consider adding on, um, Bidil or this hydralazine isosorbide drug. And so that's another one where I, I mean, I want to understand like, why is that drug you know, only effective in patients who self-identify as black. I mean, there's some hypotheses that are relates to, you know, endothelial function. And so I feel like this is why we need to understand the mechanisms because, you know, it could be that there's Japanese patients who 
have this endothelial mechanism that they would also benefit from Bido, but without further investigating, you know, why is this drug effective in some patients and not others, then we'll never know. They, some patients could be missing out on an effective therapy just based on, on their race, so. Right, and should we be looking at some other marker, like something that marks around that, what's happening with those endothelial cells right. instead of just race, yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent, excellent point. So tell us more about what your research showed um, and recommendations that you all had uh, as a result of the research. Um, sure, I mean, I can be easier if I showed some slides. That's fine, you are good to go. So, All right, can you see a full screen yes. slide? Okay, so, you know, like I said, the, the landmark trials of angio, so this, this is our most recent data in angiotensin inhibitors. And, you know, those, those landmark trials and the beta blocker trials, they were not very diverse enrollment. So my mentor, David Lanfear, um, started his own data set uh, where half the patients self-identify as black. And so it was based at Henry Ford Hospital in Detroit. Um, so, so far he's enrolled over six, 1,600 heart failure patients over the course of eight years. The patients self-report their race. When they enroll in this study, they collect detailed phenotypic information, collect a blood sample for DNA. And in this last bullet point is the important one, which I think is playing a bigger role than what we thought. All, all these patients are insured and with the same health alliance plan. Um, so the reason why we specifically enrolled patients with that health insurance plan is that allows us to collect insurance claims data. So we know exactly how many um, tablets were dispensed to the patient and when it was dispensed. So this is really different than our research here at Michigan Medicine, where, you know, we, you know, there's sure scripts, but we haven't been able to get good insurance claims data through sure scripts. Um, so we only have medication data based on what's in the EHR. So we know what the patient's been prescribed in our healthcare system, but we don't really know, you know, did they, did they pick it up at the pharmacy? Are they picking it up on time at the pharmacy? Are they getting their refills on time? Um, so this was a, like a huge benefit of, of doing research with Henry Ford Health System. Um, so we can capture like it, the patient's adherence to their medications um, um, better. And so this is the Axiom Biobank genotyping array we use, and it included a customization to include a booster of YRI, which is Yoruba um, ancestry. So this genotyping chip, we can get a lot of different kind of genetic information from it. Um, you know, it's, it was designed to optimize imputation, include some exome content, pharmacogenomic markers, and et cetera. For this particular analysis, um, we use ancestry informative markers, and we use this ancestry map 2.0 algorithm to quantify the proportion of uh, Yoruba ancestry specifically. So we use cost proportional hazards modeling. I won't go into the statistical analysis in detail. So a limitation of our data set, it is just one healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we wanted to replicate our results in independent data sets. So we um, collected a separate cohort of heart failure patients just using EHR data at Henry Ford. Um, but we also use data from, from the guided trial. So this trial, um, the purpose was to see, you know, does using measuring a patient's BNP level and adjusting their drug therapy according to that improve outcomes in heart failure patients. Okay. And um, the trial didn't work, but we have the data available to test other hypotheses like, like this one. And we did a meta-analysis of, of the results from these three different data sets for self-reported race because we didn't have um, genetic data in the guided trial. Right. And thanks to Mike Dorsch for giving me access to guided trial data. Um, so this is where we compared, you know, someone's, the proportion of Yoruba ancestry to how they self-identified as their race. And so this is where you see a really 
you know, our ancestry is a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So on the y-axis is proportion of your uh, Yoruba ancestry. And this is the patients who self-identify as black. So all the way on the right here, this little plateau is where um, the patients have 100% Yoruba ancestry. But you can see there's a wide range. And on the left side where there's this gap, there's lots of patients who self-identify as black who have zero uh, percent Yoruba ancestry. So on the bottom and in, in the patients who self-identify as white, we, we see another spectrum. And again, on the right, you know, there's patients who have 100% Yoruba ancestry. So this is why, you know, race does not always correlate with, with genetics. Right. Um, so we, we, like other studies, we look at the characteristics of these patients who um, self-identify as black or white. We saw lots of differences between them um, and the bolded p-values on the right. Like the differences we found are consistent with what's been found before. Um, patients who self-identify as black, they get heart failure at significantly younger ages. Uh, their heart function is significantly lower. The cause of their heart failure is more often high blood pressure or hypertension than coronary artery disease like it is in um, white patients. Mm -hmm. uh, they have poor kidney function, but the white, white patients more often have atrial fibrillation. What was um, encouraging for us in the bottom here is just looking at drug treatment rates. Um, so the exposure to angiotensin inhibitors was actually significantly better in the black patients. Uh, beta blocker treatment rates were significantly better too. Um, this was surprising, you know, considering Detroit is a place where there's been race riots. Um, right. So we were glad to see this and it's, it's different than, you know, Mike, Mike Dorsch's paper where he found statin prescribing. Um, so in the African-American patients in our health system at Michigan Medicine, um, they were eight times less likely to be prescribed a statin than, than white patients. So okay. again, this makes me wonder about the differences between our health system in Ann Arbor and the health system in Detroit. Right. Um, so um, on the right here is the, the comparison by Af West African ancestry. So even though 416 patients identified as black, only 309 had greater than 80% West African ancestry. And the same thing with the patients who are white. Um, 369 self-report as white, but only 353 had less than 5% um, African ancestry. And we didn't really see much differences um, when comparing by ancestry and race. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, you know, this is where I, I, you know, I already told you the answer to this, where we, we found equal benefit um, for ACE inhibitors. And this is the same in our beta blocker paper too. Mm -hmm. um, so what was, so on the, this, we had three different data sets to compare self-reported race. Here we're looking at the hazard ratio and 95% confidence interval for the reduction in the risk for death. Um, with angiotensin inhibitors. And, you know, regardless of whichever data, the two Henry Ford data sets, the hazard ratios in the black and white patients were really similar and mm -hmm. the 95% confidence intervals were overlapping. In GUIDE, it was kind of interesting. We saw a disparity in the opposite direction of high blood pressure where the black patients had a much larger reduction in the risk for mortality than the white patients and the interaction term was significant. But when we brought it all together in a meta-analysis, so over a thousand black patients and a uh, thousand white patients, the hazard ratio for these drugs was um, pretty much identical. Mm -hmm. So, I, and this is the comparison by self-reported race and ancestry. You can see it's, it's pretty much identical. Um, so yeah, so I, I really wanna understand why is there um, a racial disparity for these drugs for the treatment of high blood pressure? But I think we have pretty convincing data that there, there isn't a disparity in the treatment of heart failure. So. Fascinating, fascinating. So there's another um, component and I'll ask that question in just a moment. Well, I'll ask Amna's question. I keep hogging the show and that's not very nice of me. Um, Amna asked, can Dr. Luzum discuss the guided trial a little more? 
where were patients recruited from? So that ties into what I was thinking. Wonderful point, Amna. I can't remember if she already said it. Sorry if you did. Uh, no, I didn't say that. So Guided um, recruited patients, I think, from 40 different sites um, from the U.S. and Canada. Um, oh, but wow. I, don't think, I don't think there was, there was none of the Black patients were, were from Canada. Um, so yeah, I think it's 40 different sites um, all, over, all over the country. So a more broad geographic distribution than, than our single data set from Detroit. Right. Um, just a follow-up question. Um, yeah. Do you know that if they were like more urban, rural, I mean, I'm guessing you said it sounds pretty diverse, so they probably just took a sampling from everywhere? I'm thinking it's probably going to be more urban because, uh -huh. you know, usually these trials are done at exactly. um, ac academic medical centers, which are usually located in more urban areas. Mm -hmm. um, I think it would be hard to recruit when they're enrolling for a clinical trial, they're going to want to enroll the easiest way possible. And I think it would be difficult to try to enroll from, from rural areas. So that's my assumption. Okay, thank you. So that ties to what I was sort of wondering, and, and in no way is this any, any kind of a flaw, but um, Isabel Wilkerson's first book, The Warmth of Other Suns, recounts the great migration of African-Americans out of the South. And what we know, right, is that a contingent stopped in Detroit. Other contingents went on to places like Chicago. Uh, some stopped in Cleveland. Yep. Fortunately, some made it all the way to California. Uh, and so um, the people who stopped in Detroit became part of the automotive industry and even the state of Michigan, like over in Muskegon. Mm -hmm. And then they would call up their relatives, right? Mm -hmm. You're going to make good money here, come here and build these communities and so in some ways, it's, it's kind of a, a pseudo founder effect, if you will, thinking about genetics. Yeah. Um, and it was interesting in looking at your numbers, like it was 400, I think, and 30 some who self-identified as black and then using the genetic ancestry, it was like 309. So the majority of those still fell in this greater than 80% Yoruban ancestry. Um, yeah. And so thinking about comparing that with the guided study, mm -hmm. right? That's a crapshoot. Yeah. Right. And so I'm sorry, I'm hogging the show, but. Oh, no, no. I was like <laughs> excited. You're saying you brought up the great migration because this has come up in my research too. Yes. So I, did, more. Yeah. So I went to grad school at the University of North Carolina in Chapel Hill. My okay. whole dissertation was on pharmacogenetics for these heart failure drugs. And yes we found some interesting genetic variants that we thought were predicting beta blocker benefit. And, you know, we still knew Dr. Lanfear at that time and asked him, can we replicate our findings in your data set from Detroit? None of them replicated. <laughs> and my, men my former mentor, um, James Jackson, um, mm -hmm. before he passed away in September, he, he laughed. He's like, I'm not surprised by that. He's like, because you know, there was genetic drift because mm -hmm. of the great migration. He's like, I'm not surprised you cannot replicate genetic associations found in the South uh, with genetic associations from data from, from the North. And so that just adds like another layer. And so, yeah, so, um, you know, one statistical geneticist recommended to me, you know, we, there's, there's ways to estimate um, local ancestry versus mm -hmm. global ancestry. Right, right. So I think that could be a next step in our research. You know, we used Yoruba ancestry, but there's ways to estimate local ancestry. So right, I think right. we could look into that as well. Especially around the Carolinas, because you have those pockets where those populations really remain. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you have the people of the Gullah Islands around South Carolina and those coastal areas. So at, now my biology hat is on. I'm getting totally fascinated. Yeah, uh, yeah. And, but you, you know, I tried to replicate those same findings from North Carolina in the Jackson Heart Study. Yes. So it's all, you know, Black Americans from Jackson, Mississippi. And, yes. You know, the symbols were similar, but, but not statistically significant there. So, yeah, I just wonder, you know, how much of an effect the Great Migration had, had on genetic drift. So. Right, right. That is fascinating. Yeah. I'm going to stop because I will keep going down this road. <laughs> 
and ask if people have questions. And if you do, you're welcome to either uh, put in the chat or unmute yourself and ask anything. Dan always has a question. I'm surprised. Oh. Here he is. I was just I was just reaching for my headset. <laughs> I, I was I was really interested in your comment about the approach that you guys are taking, where you're trying to understand these clinical outcomes and figure out how much of it is attributable to genetics versus how much is non-genetics, which would mean there's some other factor involved, not non-genetics, non-pharmacological, you called it. An alternate approach would seem to be to use some kind of um, pharmacological surrogate endpoints, right? So you give a dose and see how much does the blood pressure change to a single dose or some other kind of very sensitive pharmacological response. Has anyone done that and looked at it between races or by genetics and figured out that way how much of the difference in pharmacological response, is there any and can that be attributed to race or genetics for, I guess, blood pressure or whatever other um, surrogate endpoints you could use? Yeah, I, I agree with you. I mean, I, I think there's different ways this can be done to try to tease out the pharmacologic differences from the uh, like social determinants of health. That would be one way, you know, bring heart failure patients into a clinical research unit, you know, do a washout of the drugs, although you probably can't wash out these drugs from heart failure patients because then they could decompensate and <laughs> end up admitted to the hospital. But um, so I think it would be kind of hard to do in a controlled environment for heart failure patients just because these patients are so, uh, such a delicate balance of them, like their heart compensating for, you know, what their body needs it to do versus decompensating and they need to go to the hospital. But, um, so yeah, that's, that's one way we, we thought about it, uh, bringing patients into the clinical trials unit and just giving them, you know, a dose of the drug and you can measure blood pressure, heart rate, um, things like that, but in heart failure, and I also think this is the difference between heart failure and hypertension is heart failure patients benefit from these drugs independent of the blood pressure effects. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of other mechanisms. So these drugs are more beneficial for heart failure patients because of the neurohormonal effects than the, the blood pressure lowering. Um, so there's lots of other mechanisms that these drugs are working by. Um, and it's, and heart failure, it's like a long-term treatment too. Like they need to be treated. Um, I think, it, you know, it's at least three months with a beta blocker before you can see improvement in their heart function on an echo. So I'm, I don't think in for heart failure drug response, it can't really be done in like a controlled clinical research unit. Um, so that's why we're doing it at the population level instead. Um, but yeah, I... I it's almost a flaw of this Henry Ford data is that we've eliminated some of these social differences in um, uh, the, the patients by them all having the health, same health insurance plan. So we do have some. Um, so when these patients were enrolled in this registry, they were asked, like, they were given a short survey on social determinants of health, like, um, like how, how well are you able to afford your medications um, is one of the questions they were asked. So we're actually gonna get into that um, next. Like I actually wrote a grant proposal about that to try to understand how to tease out these genetic differences from social differences, but we didn't see any differences in our data set. So um, I, I'm not sure how we could do that. Um, I asked my, like Mike, I'm like, we should look at this in our healthcare system. Mm -hmm. um, and Mike has a dashboard of heart failure, how heart, heart failure patients are treated at our health system. And, you know, the initial findings, or there's no difference in our health system either. So, um, so yeah, we, we don't really know. <laughs> what, what about in the hypertension space where you said the the difference between races is more well established, or at least seems to be more well established. Has anyone tried, and you do have the blood pressure surrogate, has anyone tried those controlled clinical experiments to see is there actually a pharmacological difference in races in their blood pressure response? I don't know if somebody's done a controlled clinical experiment, but it has been done on the population level. 
So just in November, so the SPRINT trial is this one of the most well-known hypertension treatment trials. And they just published analysis like we do, where they analyze the differences by self-identified race and West African ancestry. So they use Yoruba ancestry exactly like we did. Um, and it, that's they found out um, the racial disparity was um, explained by self-identified race. Ancestry did not explain the difference. So what they conclude from that study is, is it's social determinants of health that are determining that racial disparity and blood pressure response and not genetics, which, which alludes to, to pharmacology. Um, so yeah, so a paper was recently published in the, in the blood pressure space that um, it's, it's not pointing to genetics, it's, it's social factors. This is so awesome. <laughs> that's why when i saw this series i was like i want to talk in this series <laughs> i have a lot to say <laughs> right no this is so great and it just you know points to how race is just a fallacy right when you're talking about people who share a genetic ancestry you can get to some real quite answers but um, without it, making these assumptions based on race just shove you right into really addressing or accounting for social determinants of health, even though that's not what you think you're accounting for. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is just fantastic. Um, Dan put uh, some information in the chat. So uh, do feel free to check that out. And I'll ask if there's one more last question anyone would like to ask? Hmm. So Dan, that paper you sent is for um, thiazide diuretics. But yeah, I think Julie Johnson's group has done, they've done a lot of GWAS for beta blocker response in hypertension um, patients. But yeah, the analysis of the SPRINT trial, I, I think was really definitive and is pointing to social uh, variables, uh, predicting that racial disparity instead of genetics. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I think that's important why looking at genetics is important instead of using race as a proxy for genetics, because, um, you know, if, if it's due to genetics, then there could be some, you know, patients who self-identify as white who have certain genetic variants that could, you know, de determine which drugs works best in them. Um, okay. And the same thing for black patients who might not have a particular genetic variant that's correlated with ancestry. So um, that's why it, we've got to look at both things. Yes, definitely. Regina, can I ask a question? Yes, you can, Mike. This is Mike. Um, so Jasmine, the, the one thing that I, you know, when you go back to some er, real early papers that, that look at this as well, um, there's, there seems to be an interaction with gender as well, with race and that, you know, uh, that specifically African-American women um, may get either undertreated or um, not get the most optimal uh, treatment in some diseases. And I didn't hear you comment on that, but I wanted to, I wanted to hear your comment. Yeah, I am not familiar with gender differences um, for these drug responses. Um, I will say yeah, another thing that has made this research more complicated is that the outcome that's analyzed uh, has determined whether or not there's a racial disparity. So like those old papers in heart failure that showed um, that were really concerning and you know published in the New England Journal, when, they, when the outcome analyzed was hospitalization, they found a significant racial disparity. When the outcome was death, there was not. And so I think that's another thing we have to think about in doing racial disparity research is you know, the outcome and how subject is that to bias? Because we know, uh, and you know, my mentor, James Jackson, you know, taught me that Black Americans utilize the healthcare system differently than, than white Americans. And so if, you're, if your outcome is hospitalization and we know there's biases in which you know, 
Black Americans more often use the ER instead of a primary care doctor. And, you know, there's biases against who gets admitted to the hospital. Um, so if your outcome is hospitalization, we saw more racial disparities in, in there than um, if the outcome is death. Um, so I, that's another, another thing to consider. So we're also analyzing different outcomes um, for this data, but I, I have not heard of um, gender differences. Yeah, I put a paper in the chat that's from, it's like a New England journal from 1999, but um, showing that, you know, oh. just the recommendations for catheterization. So it's a cardiovascular, you know, space. I just wonder if there's also maybe in this. For drug this space, there might be something. I know that um, when I've talked about this to people before, you're getting back to your point that, you know, why, why is it that our, why does your data show something that's similar, maybe what U of M's data shows when it comes to heart failure in med therapy? Um, one of the things to think about that I, I didn't know about until I started looking into all this is that um, African-Americans are less likely to actually get a referral to a cardiologist yeah. um, data out there. Mm -hmm. And so if they don't get a referral to the right place, then they're not, they may not get the therapy already. So if, if the therapy is being given by people at you know academic medical centers like Henry Ford and University of Michigan, oh, but they're not getting referred to those centers, mm -hmm. then they're, they're getting under treated in the community and we don't even know about it. That's right? true. So yeah. That's just something to think about in all this is when thinking about an intervention or some sort of outreach um, that that we need to think beyond our own walls. Yeah, there. I mean, there's a there's so much work to be done. <laughs> You know, there's so many biases at every level. So I'm more familiar with the heart failure data and there's so many biases at every level of a heart failure patient's care. Like there's bias in, um, you know, when black heart failure patients are admitted to the hospital, they're less likely to be admitted to uh, a cardiac ICU as, as opposed to like a general uh, award. Um, you know, there was a really interesting grand rounds maybe a month or two ago now that showed that there's, racial bias and which heart failure patients get selected for a transplant and which which don't um so so yeah there's there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done on every level i i focus on the drugs <laughs> well this has been a wonderfully wonderfully rich conversation Dr. Luzum, I want to thank you for taking the time to do this and, and reaching out. Yes, you were sort of the first person who was like, you know, if you got a slot, I'd be happy to do this. So really glad we got to make this happen. And I want to thank each of you for attending and those of you who are watching the recorded version. And uh, we will keep this up and see how far we get over the next few months. We might have to take a break till the fall. But um, I hope that we are both informing people and um, helping people to kind of break down barriers around discussing what race means and doesn't mean in healthcare. Thank you all very Thank much. You. Enjoy the rest of your day. Bye.